incorruptible, life-giving, life-changing, mountain-moving, devil-chasing word of God. I boldly confess, my mind is alert, my eyes are open, my ears are open, my heart is open to receive the precious seed of the word. I will never be the same, never, 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 in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're still in the book of Nahum, and it's not going to be too hard for me to remember uh, when we got started, because we got started on my birthday. And so we, we're going to uh, take our time and go through here, and I don't know how in the world we have allowed all these years to pass, and we have not spent any time in the book of Nahum. Uh, I have read through the book, and I have come back, and I have looked at some things, and I tell you what, I see God all over the world. I mean, it's just so powerful. I think if we were teaching theology, we could come to the study of theology and stop right here at Nahum, and we'll be right, right on time. And so as we look at Nahum this evening, we, we're still in chapter 1. Um, just to kind of recap a few things, um, and I have to say this, and it, it really kind of make the magnified the, 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 the meaning behind or the purpose of this book that, that there's a, a comparison between the book of Jonah and the book of Nahum because they are actually dealing with the same group of people, which is actually uh, Nineveh, which is more than they most of, which is in Iraq. And so, so Jonah's preaching was actually a great revelation of God's long suffering, of his mercy, his love, and, and his, it, it just, just magnified God. It was not so much about Jonah and the fish as much as it was about God and his sovereignty and some of the other attributes that we talked about. And so right now, as we uh, get into these verses, I want to try to get down at least to verse 8 this evening if we can get there. And so very little is said about the man Nahum, so we don't know a whole lot about him. And so we, we're not saying a whole lot about him. And I've said in the past that the, the message is more important than the messenger. And the reason for that is that the messenger may die, but the message lives on. 2,000 years, and we're still preaching about Jesus Christ and his resurrection. A lot of people started off preaching Peter, Paul, James, and John. They preached the same thing. They died, but the message still lives. So, so we don't have a whole lot about Nahum as we do some of the other prophets. Some of the other prophets, we have a little more details. Like Jeremiah, we know he was went down in Egypt, and history tells us that he was actually stoned by his own people down in, in Egypt. Uh, we talk about Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah, you know, it, it said that he was sown asunder. And so there's a lot of Bible, you know, um, uh, writers, those who wrote books that we know a little bit about. But Nahum, very little we know about him. Uh, the only thing that seemed to be highlighted is the fact that he has a message of doom. Uh, his message is not one that will cause you to run, jump, and shout, and, and uh, throw money up on the altar and, and get your blessing a promise to you within seven days so he is not that type of prophet and sometimes God give you a word that is sometimes make you happy and sometimes the same word that make you happy will turn around and it'll convict you and so this is the kind of message that most people wouldn't want to hear we always want to hear the good report and this is not so much a good report as it is to um, the Ninevites but it is a good report in a sense that that it actually is going to give comfort to uh, the people of God. And the reason for it is because Nahum's name, the very name Nahum, has to do with, with comfort. And so he was kind of like comforting them because the message that he was saying is almost like, you know, the people that have oppressed you, God getting ready to deal with them. The people that have been holding you down, God is getting ready to deal with them. And see, what happens is that in, in, in this book, God, he actually brings judgment on them. And he waits a long time before he does it. God is not quick to do anything. He don't have to be in a hurry because he don't have nowhere to go. And uh, he don't have a clock that he operates by. So as we look at, look at verse 1, I'm, I'm not going to say a whole lot on verse 1. I want to read down and I want to really start elaborating around about verse probably a little bit out of verse 3, but basically verse 4 is where we left off last time. That's where I want to want to go to today. I told you last time I was going to start right with verse 4, and uh, and I meant that when I said it. And so uh, I still mean that I'm going to start it whenever I get to it uh, from 1 down to verse 3, okay? Okay, so this, this is what the word says. The burden of Nineveh, 
the book of the vision of Nahum the Elkoshite. Elkoshite. God is jealous, and the Lord avenges, and the Lord avenges it, and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and reserve it wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord has his way in the whirlwind and in the storm and in the clouds and the clouds it is of the dust of his feet. Now, I, won't, I, I, I can't just go to verse 4 but that kind of elaborating a little bit on, on these previous verses and I think that we did that for the last, ever since August 2nd we've been talking about, about these verses. Now now Nahum's message is a message of, of doom. Whenever God sends a message of judgment and doom it's obviously that, that time has elapsed. A lot of time has gone for it. God has given a lot of time and space to get it right. Now, what the mindset of God's people is that, you know, why don't you do something? In other words, it appears that, that God, you are, you are almighty. You, we, we know that you are, you are God and you are God alone. But, but you see the problem that these people are causing us. These were evil people. I mean, they were, you, you think that some of the things that happened um, in our generation has been bad. Uh, these people here would have made the news not every day only, but every hour in the day because they had a lot going on. Um, I keep recapping it, but I think to get the impact of, of the message here and why they felt the way they felt was that these people were just wicked people. I mean, when they captured, I mean, they had, um, Nahum had already seen the northern kingdom of Israel taken off into Assyrian captivity, so they all, they've already seen that. And so now uh, Judah is having a problem because, uh, you know, these people look like they're doing everything and they get away. And so what we have to understand is that it may look like somebody's getting away, but nobody gets away because we have a just God and God being just wouldn't be just if he allowed people to get away. Okay. And so, so, so he says, number one, God is jealous. And the reason for it is because He's getting ready to do something, and it's not going to be pretty. He's going to bring judgment, and one reason why is because God will have no other God before him. He is God alone, and he will not allow. See, see, it's the things that we worship that God actually, he deals with. When Jesus went into the temple and turned over the tables, why did he turn over the table? He turned over the table because that's what they were counting on. He turned over the chairs because they, they had gotten comfortable. They, they turned the street ministry into a seat ministry, so he turns it over. And see, even re really right now, a lot of the things that we have made gods out of, <laughs> you know, all you can do is see reruns. You know, I know you got a little stuff coming back in focus, but I'm just saying God is a jealous God. Uh, it's a part of who he is. It's always been that way. Nothing has been added to God. Nothing has been subtracted from God. And so as we look in the book of Jonah, we see, we see some of the attributes of God, like his long suffering. I mean, God suffered long. And actually, we see a, a degree of it right here because even with God being jealous, it says that in verse 3, the Lord is slow to anger. In other words, it takes a lot because he's so long suffering. It takes a lot to actually cause God to become angry. Now, now, some of us, if we compare ourselves, really, there's no comparison. It don't take very much at all for us to get angry. I mean, we can be driving in a very comfortable automobile, air blowing all over everywhere, you know, listening to good music, and somebody pull out in front of you, and you get angry just like that. Well, God is slow to anger. And, 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 and his reason for expl explaining this is that it takes a lot for God to bring judgment. Whenever bring, when God brings judgment, sudden judgment upon a nation or people, they've had a lot of time to get it right, and they cross the line. See, there, there is a point that you can, you can, you can cross, and you, you, it's, it, 
it's, it's no, 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 Job can't pray for you. Daniel can't pray for you. It don't make no difference who you get calling up on. God say, you're going to get it. It's coming. Okay. So, so he's, 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 he's slow to anger. He's great in power. Now, now let, let's take a look at why he's slow in anger. When Jonah preached, 120,000 people repented. The whole city. That means the old people, the young people, the middle the middle age, all of them, the whole, the king, all those in authority, they all repented. They covered themselves in sackcloth and ashes at the preaching of a rebellious preacher. And that just shows you the power of the word. It certainly wasn't, it wasn't Jonah. It was the word that did the work. So they repented. But now since then, it's been about 100 to maybe 150 years. And the reason why I say that, it was over 100 years and not more than 150 years later, that God now brings judgment. See, whenever you turn off the light, darkness automatically come in. See, wh whenever you, whenever you, when you say no to Jesus, you you already opening the door to somebody else. And so God has given them a hundred to maybe a hundred and fifty years to repent. Now watch this: if they hadn't repented in the days of Jonah, God would have judged them then. He would have judged Nineveh right then if they had not repented. But they repented, God forgave them. Now in this case, and as we get further over in this book, you will see that it was, it was like, it was almost like walking over dead people. I mean, it, it was like they were, they were killing people to such a degree that, until they were just walking over dead bodies. It's, it's almost like our streets today, you know, e even here in America and some of our cities in America, you know, it, it's, Really, no great thing for somebody to say. Newsflash: shooting took place. So many people got shot and killed, and every day, blood is in our streets. Now, these people were probably a little bit more wicked because what they were doing. Uh, you've heard me repeat it several times. I, I'm doing it because I want you to get the impact of it. Is that they were so wicked they really deserved judgment. They really did deserve God's judgment. They would take people who were leaders, like if it was a captain or somebody that was a general that was captured, they would take them and they would do like a fish, like a catfish. They would take the skin off, they would flay them. They would pull the skin off them while they're alive. They would do stuff like cut parts of your, their bodies off, like cut off their hands, cut the nose off, cut the ear off, set children on fire, cut heads off, and probably had people, an audience when they did it, and then pile the heads up in piles and almost like making pyramids out of them. And then they would take people, you've heard me say this, and I saw this in some westerns, you know, movies, but it was a practice actually in that day and time where they would take a person out in the, in the desert because it's real sandy, a lot, lot of sand. And so what they would do, they would dig a hole, put their body down in there, cover them all the way up to their chin, to their necks, pull the tongue out of their mouth, take a thorn and stick it through their tongue in the ground and watch them suffer. They would do stuff. They were just evil people, wicked people, and all, all of them deserve to have gone straight to hell. They deserve that. And the prophets and the people of God, you know, they recognize that. But the only difference between them going and us going, some of us, some, all of us deserve to go. Some will just be going with more hellish ways. Because the same judgment that judges the worst person is the same judgment that judges the best person from our point of view that has no relationship with Jesus Christ or with his blood. So I think it's amazing that we see God have, if God have mercy on people like this, then we stand a good chance. But on the other hand, if God have, have mercy on you, then everybody else have a chance. Because the same mercy that it takes to save one is the same mercy it takes to save all. So as we come down through this unfamiliar book with a lot of us, Nahum, uh, prophet, consider him a minor prophet, only three chapters and 47 verses. The word talk about him being slow in anger, great in power. In other words, it's not that God is slack in his ability. He has the power to do whatever he wants to do. I've watched guys coming up and uh, 
you know, they pick on guys. I, I don't know, you know, they, they call it today, they call it bullying, bullying. But I've watched guys, you know, that just, just pick on somebody because they thought that, you know, it wasn't nothing to them. And so they just keep picking on them and picking on them. And I've watched guys who are really just kind of, you know, slow to anger, you know, just kind of like low-key kind of in, in, person seem, seem to be kind of introverted. I've seen people like that get upset. And once they do blow the cool, it ain't not, it's nothing nice. And that is not a good comparison with God, but at the same time, I think you can get a picture right here that once you get God to the boiling point, friend, the United States Air Force can't help you. The Army, the Navy, Navy the Marine, can't nobody help you whatsoever. As a matter of fact, the Bible even tells us in Proverbs 14, 34, I hope I'm giving you the right scripture, it says that righteousness exalted a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. And see, I, even in our nation today, and I can't help but, but, but recognize and say it, we're trying to fix problems that only, you know, a heart change can fix. You know, you can't, you can't, you, you're not going to fix, fix nobody's heart by protesting and tearing down statues and all of that. The heart of man's problem is the problem of man's heart. And it ain't but one person that can do something about man's heart. I'm not talking about the cardiovascular muscle in your, in your chest. I'm talking about the real center of your being. Only God can do the work right there, and you call it regeneration. And even in regeneration, sometimes people still have struggles in that area. But anyway, you see these are some, some wicked people, and they deserve, they deserve judgment. But I'm glad that God didn't judge them in this case, I mean in the case of uh, Jonah, because they repented. Because if God didn't judge them in the case of Jonah, and even, the people, even though the people repented, that means that God would have to judge you and I. And, and good thing about us on this side of the cross, what really helps us is that God's justice has been satisfied in the person of Jesus Christ. But now watch this, the only way the only way you can escape God's justice is be in Jesus Christ. It's almost like being in the ark. As long as you were in the ark during the days of the flood, you were safe. And, and, and the judgment, the ark didn't stop the judgment. Actually, the ark actually was judged for the eight people that was on the inside. All the, all, all the rain and, the, and, the, and the, the wind and the turbulence that, that, that was beating up, it beat up on that boat, that boat was beaten, beaten. But they were safe on the inside. So God's justice has to be satisfied, and he's a just God. And so right now, what we're getting ready to see, we're getting ready to see God's justice, but then, but then as we continue to read, we'll see that not only does God's justice show up right here, but his goodness. See, see watch this here now. See, if, if God didn't exercise justice, then it would have an effect on God's goodness. And because God has goodness, it sometimes takes care of his justice. So if, for instance, if, if a judge let every wicked person out of prison, right, and they just go out and, and just kill up some folk, he wouldn't be a just judge. So if God allowed a wicked, that's why he says he would not acquit the wicked. Let, let me see if I can just go and do this because I want to get, I really want to get to verse four. So, so watch verse three again. It says, the Lord is slow to anger. Thank God he is. And great in power. And he has so much power that he has never had to exhaust all of his power in doing anything. Let, let me say this. There was a scripture that Deacon Stroy uh, just read and it got my attention over in Psalm number eight. When it talk about his faith, could could y'all turn there just for a moment? Because I, I I don't I don't I hadn't committed it to memory, and I, it's just something that caught my attention. I want you to see something here. Okay, it's in Psalm number eight, and it's in verse three. The word says in verse three, Psalms eight, verse three. It says, "When I consider thy heavens, you see that, and the work of thy." Fingers, 
You see that? The moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visited him? But now watch this here. Creation, you can go back to Nahum, creation was just God's finger work. I mean, look at the galaxies. I mean, telescopes now is able to see further off in space than we ever have in the history of mankind. And they have found planets out there that has a sun that's larger than the sun in our milky galaxy. That was God's finger work. In other, in other words, creation was God's finger work. Somebody put it like this here. Everything that is, is God caused. And when it comes to creation, he didn't have try. All he did was just say the word. He said the word. Now, if you really want to see a demonstration of his power, who has believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? In other words, when we talk about crucifixion, now we're talking about God rolling up his sleeve. Now we're talking about more than finger work. Now we're talking about his right, his right hand, his right arm. Okay? So, so God is not slack when it comes to power. But the thing that keeps God off of us is his long suffering. And, and, and right now on this side of the cross, the thing that keeps God off of us, gossipers and, and ditch diggers and, 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 and liquor drinkers and, and weed smokers, blunts or whatever you want to call it, and adulterers and fornicators and, 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 and all this stuff, gamblers, putting lottery tickets in your Bible, think that's going to be the right number and all that. The only thing that keeps God off of us today is the cross of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. And see, he's, he, he, he advocates. He's, a, he's at the right hand of the Father. And actually, it's him. It's him. It's him that pleased the Father. You, you're not blessed because of you, you. You're blessed because of him who pleased the Father. I, like, I, I thank God for what Minister Mike said. It's not our goodness. It's, it's, it's the goodness of God that is manifested through the person of Christ. Jesus satisfied the Father in every way, every way. Okay, now watch this. Let, let, let's see if we can get, get down through him. We're almost here. So the word is saying in the middle part of verse 3, it says now, he's great in power and say, and will not at all acquit the wicked. In other words, he's not going to let them off. Sometimes we, we have a tendency to think that God don't like this group of people and he don't like that group of people because look like one group of people, they get away. Let me tell you something. God has a time set. And the time will come when God will judge every individual and every nation. And let me just show you sometime how, how God, God categorized uh, judgment. God judges cities. You remember Sodom and Gomorrah? God judges nations. Look at Israel and Babylonian captivity. And at the same time, God judges leaders. Look at Nebuchadnezzar. And then, not only that, God judges individuals, even though he was an individual leader, but, but he judges individuals. And he judges groups of people. You understand that? And so, that's the reason why I'm not trying to fight my battle. I got somebody greater than me that's fighting my battle. So, so while, while people are uh, unrest and unsettled. I'm settled in my spirit because there's a God who looks high and he looks low. And God has no problem with looking at different colors. God sees different colors. He knows the difference between black, white, red, brown, yellow. God knows the difference and but but he see but he only sees but one color in the blood. Okay? So he don't have no problem. But what I'm saying is that the time will come when God will make things right. Every time we try to fix something we, 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 we do what I call ingenuity. Um, we used to call it something else, but I call it, uh, if you want to put a color to it, I call it black ingenuity. It just simply means that we, we, we rig stuff up. But I want to tell you something about rigged up stuff. After a while, the rig going to wear out. The best thing to do if you got a problem, don't take it to the shade tree. 
you take it to the one that made the thing. And see, what we're trying to do with this world, all over the world now, people are protesting. They're trying to fix the problem. But the problem can only be fixed by the one who made us. And he is the maker. You know, and so, and so, so God is, is he, he got great power. He's not going to let the wicked get away. Now watch this here. You know, before they have fights and things like that, they always have a preview, right? You know, and I, and I tell you what, some, most times the preview is better than the fight. So, so it's almost like God gives a preview right here of the judgment that's coming. So what, watch this here now. So it says, the Lord hath his way in the whirlwind. In a dusty place where there's a lot of dust and you got a whirlwind, we just saw Lara. Was it Hurricane Lara? They used to just name hurricanes after women. Now they name them Bob and Billy and everybody, you know. At one while, they were just naming hurricanes after, after women. And uh, I, I, there were two reasons for that, but I, I don't even want to even go there. <laughs> I tell you what, you don't want to make a female angry. And, uh, and, and one guy said, well, one reason why they named him after women was because you never heard of a hemorrhicane, have you? Well, now we have, so I mean, they, they, they have, you know, they, they changed that. But the thing about it, we just experienced Hurricane Laura coming through and winds. As a matter of fact, we have a piece of tin that's over in the parking lot right now that blew off the top of a building over there. So wind can be very destructive. I mean, sometimes it can be pleasant. You know, if you're in a breeze, you got it's been hot, you, you, you're in the shade and there's a breeze, but a whirlwind is something else. And see, God don't have to put a finger on you. He can use creation. So he's talking about he have his way in the whirlwind. See, 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 a lot of people would, if they think they could see God's face and not die, they would say, Lord, I want to see your face. Well, if you saw God's face, it wouldn't look like your face. So the closest thing to looking at the face of God is in the face of Jesus Christ. He is the face of God. But now God has a way of revealing his presence without showing his face. All right? And I would much rather God not show me his face, but just show his hand. Now, he can show his hand in the positive and he can show his hand in the negative. It depends on what side you own. Okay, so now watch this here. So he have his way in the whirlwind and, and watch, because when an invading army would come in, they, they had horses and chariots and being so dusty, you can see dust coming up for miles. You see the dust coming up. And God is, is symbolizing that type of judgment that the dust is going to rise but it's going to be more like in the clouds. He's just giving, a, giving us a, a, a picture here. So he has his way in the whirlwind. And then it says, and in the storm. No, and in the storm. Wow, man, ain't that something? We just saw one. And the clouds are the dust on his feet. Now watch this here. here we finally got to verse number four. He rebuked the sea. Now why is this necessary? Because he got power so... We want to show you Nahum is, is, is giving a demonstration of his power. You see, I, I, I was in the gym one time and uh, well, I don't even want to talk about that because I, I, I don't even want to do that. But, but, but I, I watched people and they were trying to impress folk with how strong they were. I, you, if anybody been in the gym, if, if a bunch of guys in the gym, you know, they just do what's normal. You understand that? But if, if, if guys come in the gym and they see a lot of females come in the gym, they like to flex a little bit. So they put a lot of weight on there so them girls can see, wow, he is strong. Well, they don't really have the capacity to know how much that really is. They don't know that. They don't know, some of them, they don't know if that's the difference between 100 pounds and 1,000 pounds. So you're just wasting, wasting time. But anyway, what, 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 what Nahum is doing right here is almost like flexing God's muscles to let you know that hey you don't really want to deal with God like that you really want to be on his side see a lot of people are God haters and God despisers but one day they'll have to meet him I remember old Job y'all remember Job 
if you if you're reading the Bible, that's not some, that's not an application for a job. His name is really Job. You know, Job said, you know, I I I got three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, and they have just become miserable counselors. And he said, neither is there is there a daysman betwixt us that may join my hand and God's hand. Together and bring us one. So, so it's almost like uh, Job is saying, whenever I see God, I'm going to tell him all about it. And actually, God kind of showed up in a whirlwind. And Job put his hand on his mouth because there's something about the presence of God. And, and, that, and that's what the church needs to realize, you know, his presence. His presence demands reverence and respect. And, and, and now watch this here, because you, you just don't realize how close his presence is. See, at one point, God was for us. He always has been for us. And when, they, when, they, when he was born, Emmanuel, he would be called Emmanuel, it means God with us. So, yes, God was with us. But if you're born again, now God is in us. His presence. And let me tell you something about his presence. Never leave you. You can't send his presence away, S-E-N-D, and you can't send his presence away, S-I-N. People don't realize how powerful they are when you come into a place, not because of you, but because of who's in you. See, you have the ability to touch God without even having a plug, without having your battery charged, or whatever. Best technology in the world is right there on the inside of you. Don't need no satellite to communicate with our, our daddy. And he hears. Now watch, now watch this here, though. Watch this here. Now watch. Now, now watch this here. He, he rebuke it, the sea, and make it a dry. God does some amazing things with water. <laughs> I mean, just water. Some people say, you know what? You just as weak as water. God can take the weak things of this world and confound the things that are supposed to be strong. I mean, water, you can walk through it. You can swim through it. But then now, at some points in time, water can be devastating, dangerous. They were talking about, you know, how, 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 how the water, they, they, they were thinking that Lake Charles may have been covered in water by the time the surge was over from Hurricane Laura. Water, we see what water did to uh, New Orleans. What was the girl's name? Katrina. Make sure you don't name none of your baby girls Katrina. <laughs> Katrina has a bad name. Don't name her Katrina. Maybe, maybe Regina, but not Katrina. But, but let me just show you. God, God has done some amazing things with water. As a matter of fact, you know, there was a judgment that took place prior to uh, God say, let that be. In, in, in other words, now watch this. In, in, in Genesis 1, the word say, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, right? And the earth was without, without form and void. That's the gap theory. I don't want to deal with the gap theory. Don't ask me no question. I don't want you to go there. But say the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So the waters had come from something for some reason. And there was a, apparently a judgment of some type that had happened to the earth between verse 1, verse 2, Genesis. Because the world was not created void, but to be inhabited according to the book of Isaiah the prophet. So, so I'm telling you, God uses water, you know, sometime in a miraculous way. Let me just give you a few accounts that I just thought I'd just kind of know. He's used, he used water in the flood. Water came down from heaven, and water came up out of the ground, flooded the whole earth, kept Noah and his family safe inside the ark. And then you think about you think about God um, um, used water to secure Moses. They were drowning the babies in the Nile, and then, then here, here it is. Moses is rescued off the bosom of the water. God used that water. And, and then you think about 
in the days of Israel's wilderness wandering, they came to a place where the water was bitter. They couldn't drink it. So they threw a stick in the water. And the water became sweet. We just talked last week about a stick being cut down and thrown in the water. And the axe head swim. So God really, he uses, he uses water. In one place in the Bible, Moses speaks to the rock. Water comes out. Another time he spoke to the rock, well, he, he smote the rock and water came out. Think about the water of the Red Sea. It was congealed on both sides. In other words, he made the water of the Red Sea just like jello on both sides while they walked through on dry ground. I tell you, God really, he really uses water. And, and, and then you talk about when they crossed the Jordan. The waters backed up all the way up to the city of Adam when the priest took the ark and their feet touched the water. They backed all the way up to the city of, of Adam. God uses water. Yes, it, it, it. And then think about at the wedding in Cana. He turned the water into wine. Ain't that interesting? That, that to me it is. It's real interesting. And then think about uh, one night he was, he was walking on the water. You remember when Peter said, uh, you know, Lord, if it's you, bid me come. He walked on the water. And, and then, you know what? Uh, in Egypt, he told Moses, you know, I'm going to let you do some miracles. So Moses took his rod and turned the water into blood. I'm telling you, God is interested in water. And, 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 and not only that, you remember the Samaritan woman? He went to the well. Actually, he said, I must needs go through. Samaria, and there was a woman at the well with some buckets. She wanted to draw her water, but, but Jesus didn't have nothing to draw water with. He said, I, I, got, I got some living water. I give, I give you that. So, so you give me a drink of that water, and I give you a drink of this water. You'll never thirst again. So it's amazing how God takes creation. God said, I don't have to put no hand on you. Uh, I don't have to touch you. I don't have to put hands on you. I can just tell the wind to blow you down. I told Junior one time, that boy, I said, boy, let me tell you something. I said, boy, let me tell you something. I said, you don't want to fight me. I'll swing at you so hard that if I miss you, the wind will knock you down. <laughs> I, I said, well, one time I said, if I, if I swing at you and I don't hit you, the, the wind will give you pneumonia. See, God is amazing. God can use simple elements and do miracles. He used the jawbone of bass. There wasn't nobody else around there. And so around there with a sword. So he told Samson he should get the jawbone of the ass. And he killed a thousand Philistines. And one time he made an ass talk. <laughs> a donkey talk. <laughs> oh, boy. That, but bless God. I asked Keisha one time, I said, Keisha, there's two animals in the Bible that talked. I said, what were they? I was schooling her. She said, there was a serpent. And I said, what was the other one? She said, <laughs> a booty. <laughs> I, said, I said, Keisha, it's a donkey, man. Hey, we are mature. Hey, it was a donkey. And, 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 and the word used it there, so we just have to use it in proper context. Okay. All right. So now here, here, here we have a demonstration of God's power. So look, look at verse 4. You see verse 4? The word says he rebuked the sea and make it, it dry. Watch this here now. You remember the Red Sea? In other words, God say, dry up. And now the children of Israel who has spent 430 years in Egyptian bondage. In some places you see 400 years, in some places you see 430. Well, I think when you see 400 years, it's actually talking about the years of their slavery. When you see 430 years, I think you, you add on to that the 30 years that they lived in Egypt prior to uh, Joseph, de uh, the Pharaoh's death. So when they first came down to Egypt, they were, they were entreated you know, well. I mean, they were treated wonderful. But when that Pharaoh who initially uh, allowed Joseph to bring him down when he died, now they put him under hard taskmasters. 
So for 430 years, they had been down in Egypt and God dried up the Red Sea. Now, now watch this here. To allow them to come over the Red Sea, you're talking about a couple million people. It took a little time for them to all get through that dry land. See, 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 see what they're saying is that, that look here now. You don't want to mess with God. You, you don't, that, that's like some guys. I, I remember TT one time, it was some guy was playing, uh, they were playing softball. No, they were gambling. That's what it was. They were gambling. Yeah, he saved now. He ain't even here tonight anyway. He ain't streaming. Uh-uh. And, and so, but anyway, he was messing with a guy that actually had a reputation for cutting people up. And, and Nietzsche, Robert T. Smith, who gone on to be with Jesus, he said, uh, you, he told T.T., he said, you probably didn't know who you were messing with. That guy cut you up more times than you can imagine. So the language right here is that, look, you really don't want to mess with God. But now here's the, here's the, here's the thing. Right now, you in for it, and ain't no way you can get out of it. Doom is coming. So I just want to tell you a little bit of what to expect. He rebuked it, the sea. You see that in the Red Sea. The waters was uh, caught up on both sides, and you read the language in the, in the Hebrew, it was congealed. It was just like jello. Now watch this. By the time they all got over, don't you know Israel could have outrun, they could have caught up with them? But here's what God did. That pillar of fire and that pillar of cloud that followed them got between them and the people. See, see, we don't realize the presence of God that's with us that a lot of times when the enemy will snatch us up and cut us off. That's, that's, why, that's why David said that, that, you know, he talked in the, in, in the Psalms about the Lord being the door, his, his shield and his buckler because he's our protection. And so he protected them until they all passed over. Now to show you how, how dumb, you know, the Egyptians were, if he had kept me back that long, and all of a sudden now, he moved out of the way, Deacon Lon is still back there, Fendi. I'm not Fendi, F-E-N-D-I, I'm not Fendi go through there because the water might come back down on me and that's exactly what happened so look at God's track record you, you, you don't think that God can solve the problem that you dealing with right now look at his track record huh just look at his track record you don't have to look at somebody else's record look at your record look at what he's already done for you if he, if he did it one time he'll do it again that's the kind of God we serve okay but now watch this here and I want to apologize I'm not going to get to verse 6 I'm going to stop here at verse 4 but, but now watch. It says, now he rebuked it to see. He make it is dry, and he dried up all the rivers. Bashan languished, and Carmel, and the flower of Lebanon languishes. And when you talk about languishing, it means that it's almost like a plant that's dying for lack of water. Now, now what's happening right here? In other words, say not, not only... Is God going to touch the elements, but God going to test your, he going to mess up your economy. Because these areas right here were the most fertile uh, 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 grounds in, in Palestine. So if he dry them up, if they languish it and they're not getting water, that means the economy getting ready to go bad. In other words, money ain't going to be flowing like it once did. You see, I've, I've noticed something. When, when God brings judgment, especially with this 21st century generation of people, what really get our attention when he start pulling it out of our pocketbook? Huh? I, I, I remember one time, we, I, I used to, I was a deacon a long, long time ago, and uh, they used to do what was called a benevolent offering. And usually it wasn't too much. 
I, I used it. They used it for, I know. Um, I, I know uh, Joyce and and uh, and Doris and some of them that that was around. They, they probably and Leslie remember they used to have a benevolent offering. They they take that quarter and they beat that bench. You can see them benches where they just beat beat them benches up with them quarters. They be knocking. They want you to bring quarter was big back then. It was really big, you know. And so they they you know they put that money together. And I, and I remember I'm I'm not lying to you. I wouldn't lie to you in here on top of the building. Neither one. And and so so we 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 put the money in handkerchiefs, right? And I used to go, you know, doing my duties as a deacon, I, I used to go and visit the sick people, and they always would want to send them a little change. Usually it was about $2 or something of a change. That was big right then because you could buy some grape juice and you could buy some, some, uh, some sank of coffee, you know, uh, where you just heat it up with the water, you know, instant coffee and all that kind of stuff. You get a loaf of bread, and then if you wanted a honey bun, uh, a babe root, you get something like that. So it was really very, it was very economical. <laughs> okay, but but anyway, I, I I walked in there and and I tell people I say um yeah I just came to, came to see you uh, so and so so and so, and uh, they just laying like they couldn't hardly move, and uh and I say hey, and by the way I brought you a little change. They they open their eyes and say sure enough, <laughs> so so money always have a tendency to get our attention. And so what God is, what, what he's saying right there, not, you, you're going to be judged. And see, think about, about the storms and all that. It's going to not only affect the ground from growing, but it's going to affect wildlife. I know one time they had a discussion, we, we were telling them that during the tribulation period, you know, um, you know, you're going to probably, you know, uh, suffer for me. It's going to be a meat, meat shortage. So I might say, well, you feed the cows long enough, they'll be all right. But then somebody came back and said, well, you know what? If all the grass is burned up, cows can't eat. So you still got a problem. See, one thing is like a domino effect. It affects another. So if the beef is gone and the ground is not producing, now you got recession, depression, you got a problem. So God, when God moves in judgment, it's not a comedy show. It's for real. It's for real. And so this is the preview. So now watch this here. So it says, he rebuked it to see. He make it it dried, and it dried, I'm in verse 4, and it dried up the rivers. Bashan languished, and Carmel, and the flower of Lebanon languished. In other words, it's going to be a drought. It's going to be a, in other words, you can get food stamps if you want to, but food stamps won't buy what's not on the shelf. I went, uh, you know, they just started talking about everybody getting prepared for the hurricane. See, people are panic buyers. They say, you know, prepare for the hurricane. You know, it's, it's amazing how we believe what the news say, but we won't believe what the word of God say. And so they say, you know, prepare, prepare. I, I've done that before. I, I, I went and filled my tank up one time. They say, you know, they got a gas shortage. You better go get you some gas. I'm standing in line. we well, not sitting. I was sitting in line. Getting, and I got the thing. I say, you know what? It can only last so long. Gas. But anyway, I went into this particular store in the town of this great, big, beautiful city of Benton. And um, dog, I'm saying, where all these people come from? And you start looking for sandwich meat. I just wanted to get some sandwich meat. I'm saying, dog, where the bologna and stuff, all this would be is, say, golly, man, what's going on here? I know there's going to be a meat shortage somewhere in the future, but dog, got in this. I thought it was going to be after the rapture. Shucks. And I was hungry. I'm serious. I, I, really, I was going to, I was going to get, grab it. But then I did find some, and I said, I tell you what, that's, I'm going to fix this here. I saw some of that pushed back. I got four of them. I said, I'll fix that. But, but the thing about it is that when ain't nothing on the shelf, when you got money but it don't work for you, See, let me tell you something. God know how to get our attention. He know how to get our attention. And so, so wicked people 
hey, don't, don't worry about them because God has a time reserved for judgment. And listen to me, nobody gets away. It's only one way to get away from the judgment of God. I'm, I'm, I'm quitting right here. It's only one way to get away from the judgment of God on this side of the cross, and that's to run to shelter. That's to run to safety. And the only place of shelter and safety is Jesus Christ. I know a lot of people make light of the cross, and a lot of people say that all, every time y'all Baptist people preach, you always got to put him in the grave and bring him out of the grave. Well, he didn't stay there. That's why we bring him out. That's why we preach the, res the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But because, the, it, because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes it. And so the only place of safety and refuge is in Jesus Christ. And the thing about it, he will forgive anybody. It does not make any difference who they are, what they have done. He will save and secure and protect from judgment whoever called upon his son, Jesus Christ. So, I mean, that, that's kind of taking a little flip from, from where, where they're headed in judgment right here in the book of Nahum. But I'm closing this evening by saying to each one of us and maybe people who may hear this message somewhere in the future, sometime it may sneak, sneak out on the radio or whatever, and somebody hear it and say, you know, I don't have a relationship with Jesus. And every person that does not, the wrath of God abided on that individual. But there's a place of escape. And it's in Jesus. And the reason why he's a place of escape, because just like the flood waters hit the ark, which was a type of Christ, God's judgment hit Jesus Christ, was put upon him. That's why the word says he was wounded for our transgression, bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement for our peace was upon him. And with his strife we were healed, and all we like sheep were gone astray. We turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened out his mouth. He's led as a lamb to the slaughter. That's a sheep before she is a dumb. And so God did to Jesus what should have been done to you and I. And so we're qualified. We're qualified for safety if we just call upon his name. If we believe, that's all it takes, believing that he died and rose from the dead, then you can be safe from his judgment because there's a judgment day coming for the wicked. And let me tell you something. Nobody gets away. I know a lot of, lot of, lot of what we you understand. I know a lot of what we're dealing with now. Uh, everybody's talking about racism. And, uh, you, know, you, you know, you can't fix that problem without a change of heart. And certainly there are people who are not saved that may not have that type of spirit. But, but it's, it's, it's what, it's what needs to happen on the inside. Only God can can fix that. Only God can fix that. If somebody do you wrong, do this. Do them right. Bless them that curse you. Pray for them that despitefully use you and persecuted you. I mean, God, you mean to tell me <laughs> you want me to pray for people, share the good news with people that have been my oppressors? God said, yeah. You say, Lord, wait a minute now. You mean to tell me people that used to wear hoods over their heads and burn down our houses and rape our wives and kill our children? You say, preach to them too? God said, mm hmm. Mm hmm. And I know it's a challenge right now. And every time you listen to the news and you hear all these different reports, it challenges your heart. Because what you want is justice. But, 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 but watch this here. Only true justice comes from God. He's the only one that can fix the problem. It's wrong for anybody, whether you black, white, red, brown, or yellow, to mistreat, to kill somebody. It's, it's wrong. It's wrong. And the only thing can fix it is the preaching of the gospel. But we have minimized, we have underestimated the word of God, and so we think we got to do something on the side. I'm going to tell you what we need to do. We need to preach Jesus Christ, do what the word of God says. God can change me. He changed you, didn't he? If you're born again, he changed you, didn't you? Didn't he? And then there's some of you that's probably here right now. You probably at one point in time 
was prejudiced. You probably had a little racism. Didn't like certain colored people. And there's some black people that's racist against black people. If you brighter than me, we're gone with your stuck up there. That's what I just I just look at because I used I, I used to have a problem, you know, with real bright people. They they thought they was something better. And I used to fight. I, I had a lot of fights because people called me blackie. And I really wasn't as black as I thought. But it was because I stayed in the sun so much, I didn't realize the sun had made me so black. And I thought that it was a sin to be black. I didn't want to be that black. They called me blackie. And then that didn't work, so they just started calling me bear. Like black bear. I got a many, many, many fights over there. Because I felt like, you know, don't, and, and, and then too, I used to use Noxzema. I said, maybe if I brighten up a little bit. I used to go to bed looking like a white guy. Put all that Noxzema on my face. Man, my, my skin was so tight. I said, golly, boy. I, I still look the same. It ain't working for me. So I learned how to appreciate the skin that I'm in. And you need to appreciate whatever skin you in. Don't try to change whatever God has given you and put you in. Bless his name. Father, I thank you for the word this evening. Thank you especially for the powerful word Minister Mike shared with us. And I pray that as we uh, do our best to study in this book of Nahum, I pray, God, that our study be not in vain, that you really bring in things out of this word that is, is going to help us, make us better, and, and help us to show the love of Jesus Christ in a lost, sin, sin-cursed world. And Father, I pray for people who need that change of heart, that the right person will communicate the gospel with them. I pray that we don't give up on evangelism and preaching Jesus Christ in the resurrection. I still believe that's where the power to save men is right there. That's what I believe. And I pray for every person on the sound of my voice right now that may be listening or heard this message and not, not accepted Christ. I pray that they make a decision right now to receive Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. Father, I give you the praise. I give you the glory and the honor from the depths and the sincerity of my heart. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Bless the Lord. I'm going to ask you if you remain standing. And while you do, I want to ask Mr. Everett Harris if he'd come and extend the invitation.